I'm going to present um, water mist protection for turbine enclosures. And we'll start by having a little look at some of the traditional solutions for turbine enclosure protection. Uh, facility, manager, facility managers have long toiled over deciding on the safest and most effective way to protect enclosures. Um, whether they're low pressure or high pressure carbon dioxide systems, um, they are the most common systems used at the moment, but the industry is now leaning towards safer solutions and water mist fire suppression is one of those options. So just run briefly through the types of um, fire suppression that you can find in turbine enclosures. Uh, Halon fire suppressions. Uh, for many years, Halon 1301 was the holy grail of fire suppressants for high value assets uh, that would be damaged by traditional sprinkler systems. But unfortunately, in 1989, when the Montreal Protocol determined that Halon depleted the ozone layer, uh, the US Environmental Protection Agency subsequently banned its manufacture in 1994, and the search was then on for replacements for Halon. So we move to an obvious uh, replacement to Halon systems, which are clean agents that can be FM200 or more recently Noveg. Um, they are a very good alternative to Halon, but this too um, has recently in the last few years started to enter in, in, into a phase out, uh, the phase out phase. And uh, so they were very effective in extinguishing fires, but uh, they did have a disadvantage in terms of turbine enclosures specifically in that they can be very costly to refill. Uh, aerosol uh, systems are not, not so common, um, but they have the big advantage that they are easy to maintain, but very expensive to clean up after a discharge. Um, NFPA, defines aerosols as a, finely, as a finely divided solid and they remain in the air for a long time um, and are total flooding agency agents. Statex aerosol is currently used for the smaller package generator enclosures. So CO2 fire suppression systems are uh, the, the common factor when it comes to turbine protection. Um, carbon dioxide has many positive attributes as a fire suppressant. It's often known as the original clean agent. It doesn't leave behind any residue, so it doesn't damage equipment. It's plentiful, it's non-corrosive, it's highly effective. Uh, CO2 suppresses fires through oxygen dilution, uh, unlike other clean agents like Halon. However, and there's always a but at the end of the at, the at the end of the positive sentence. The concentration range of CO2 needed to suppress most fuel fire fires ranges between 34% and 72% volume over volume percentage. CO2 levels alone um, above 7.5% are determined to be extremely dangerous to humans. So they cause fainting, convulsion, or death can occur within seconds of exposure. I'm quoting there from Skaggs, 1998. Uh, this knowledge of the hazards related to CO2 systems has been a main factor in the, in the push for more safety guidance and regulation within the systems. NFPA 12 section 4.3 um, has particularly concentrated on this aspect and it now requires all CO2 systems to have proper safety procedures and life safety equipment in place. For example, uh, consideration of hazards to personnel, warning signs placed in conspicuous areas, evacuation procedures in place, electrical clearances between CO2 systems and live parts, lockout vials, wintergreen odorizer to warn of CO2 release, and new pneumatic time delay, uh, which is NFPA 2015, which is that, um, that system whereby you uh, have a certain amount of time uh, to evacuate personnel from your 
from your area where your fire event is um, before releasing the CO2 system so as not to endanger their lives. So although CO2 has many great firefighting attributes, its inherent danger to worker safety has many looking to alternative methods that offer equal su suppression and minimal life safety threats. High pressure water mist suppression is the future. It's a good title. So contrary to carbon dioxide, high pressure water mist systems are non-hazardous to personnel. Water mist has many benefits that the gaseous agents don't have. And these include, they don't have toxicity issues, they have minimal damage and reset times, and there's no requirement for an airtight enclosure. In power generation, water mist systems are typically used for combustion tur turbines and diesel generators. These are usual, usually total flooding systems, each adjusted for the size of the equipment that they're protecting. The three mechanisms of water mist systems that suppresses fire are local oxygen displacement by evaporation, radiant heat blocking of flames, and rapid evaporative cooling of flame and surrounding gases. So on this, uh, this chart here, we can see the beneficial aspects of water mist. Uh, so water mist system, uh, by virtue of being water mist, only uses water. Uh, it uses very little amounts of water. So one liter of water will turn into 1,700 liters of vapor. Uh, it has a very high cooling effect. It shields against heat, against heat radi radiation. Um, large expansion during vaporization stops and reduces oxygen to the fire. And 80 or 90 percent less water than tr traditional sprinkler systems uh, means less damage, but it also means less of a footprint when it comes to particularly um, gas turbine uh, enclosures on an offshore platform uh, where, where you can imagine that there would be very little space uh, available for additional equipments. This is a chart that I show in a lot of my presentations, but it's just um, a very effective way of showing how um, higher the higher the pressure and the smaller the, the, the droplet of water, uh, the, the better the cooling effect that you, you get. So if you look at the chart um, with um, pressure bar being on the bottom line, you can see that after we get past 50 uh, bars, we start to get a very, very efficient cooling effect in a fire event. This is uh, an extract from the matrix, which is uh, published on the IWMA uh, website. And I just thought it would be a very easy way of uh, summarizing what the standards are that cover turbine enclosure protection by water mist. And as we can see here, it's mainly, we have two uh, sets of approvals, FM and VDS. And the approvals briefly or broadly divide into the type of machinery spaces or turbine enclosures which are being protected in terms of, vo of their volume. So we have under 80 cubic meters, under 260 cubic meters, and then over 260 cubic meters. And it's very much up to the manufacturer to uh, decide uh, how, how big and how large they want to go in terms of their testing. Uh, when you go in and you test against FM, excuse me, when you go in and you test against uh, FM, you are testing your water nozzle inside um, a, a mock-up uh, of that particular size, and you can decide um, how many nozzles and where, where you want to position those nozzles in order to get the maximum effect. There is also a secondary procedure, which is 
the the listing of your your parts. So uh, FM will approve your DIOM, so your design, installation, operation, and maintenance um, manual, and it will also list the components that you have tested by them and, and which are appropriate for use in, uh, an, an, in a turbine enclosure system that is approved by FM. So this is a typical example of a water mist nozzle distribution in, in a turbine enclosure. So what you have here is um, a turbine enclosure, and on the red lines we have our we have our distribution lines coming into a nozzle. So in this particular example, we have a turbine enclosure which is uh, 260 cubic meters. And we have three, three nozzles um, covering the space. Um, the nozzle that uh, our company has developed for this type of fire protection is uh, an open type of nozzle. So it's uh, a system that is uh, manually activated. Um, it's part of a deluge system using the to uh, used in total flooding applications. It's designed to discharge water at a pressure at 100 bar at 7.3 litres per minute, and it can cover an area of 4 by 4 metres with a maximum ceiling height of 5 metres. So it has a K factor of 0.73. Uh, ultra fog nozzle component, components that are precision manufactured of stainless steel and other corrosion resistive materials. Nozzles have been tested in accordance with IMO resolution and FM approvals uh, in order to achieve the best and the most reliable function. They're easily constructed and consist of only four non-moving parts. Um, this ensures a safe and uniform quality when assembling the nozzle components. Each nozzle is equipped with a 120 micron filter to prevent clogging. And as I said, it's been tested according to FM5560 Appendix C and meets the intent of the NFPA 750 for the best and most re reliable functions. So once we've got our enclosure with its nozzles, um, however many they are, um, positioned and piped, uh, we need to move them to the delivery system. Uh, this is a typical, typical example of a water mist firefighting skid, as we call them, or FFS. And what we can see is we have um, here on, in the main occupant of the, of the skid is what we call our accumulator unit. And the accumulator unit is made up of a number of water bottles and a number of uh, nitrogen bottles. So briefly, just to explain how the system operates. Now, the accumulator unit is driven by compressed nitrogen, which is stored in cylinders at a pressure of about 200 bar. A pressure switch and a pressure gauge is used to monitor the pressure to ensure there are no leaks in the system. And there is a sufficient amount of nitrogen to protect the turbine enclosure for the correct amount of time. Upon activation, one of the, the, the pilot cylinder within the accumulator system is activated. This releases the nitrogen, which in turn activates the slave cylinders and therefore pressurizes the water cylinders. The number of cylinders supplied of the accumulator system is determined by the water requirement for the hazard area. So that's the turbine enclosure itself and a pressure calculation. One nitrogen cylinder, the pilot, is fitted with a solenoid actuated valve and all the other gas or nitrogen cylinders, which are commonly called slaves, are fitted with pneumatic actuators. When the system is activated, the master, the master valve opens first and in turn distributes the nitrogen to pneumatic actuators. This allows all the cylinders in the system to open simultaneously, 
causing the water to, di to discharge evenly. This sequence is repeated for all of the accumulator units. Activation of the system takes place in sections, manually or automatically. This can be done by using the manual override switch on a solenoid valve or by activating the system ele electrically via control panel situated outside the enclosure itself. A reserve accumulator units can be furnished um, if a reserve or backup system is required, and these require check valves to separate water flow between the main and the reserve systems. All nozzles in the, activation, in the activated section generate water fog, and the system shall be designed to protect the hazard area for the minimum of 10 minutes. When I say minimum of 10 minutes, that is what is um, written in NFP 750, if I'm not if I'm not um, in error there, but many customers require that there should be a longer um, <coughs> discharge time. So, and the larger the enclosure, the larger the discharge time. So sometimes, sometimes you'll be going up to 20 and often up to 30 minutes discharge time. That has a big impact on your footprint um, because it has obviously uh, a need for additional accumulator unit cylinders. Um, in this case, the system was designed for the protection of uh, machinery spaces and combustion turbines and enclosures with volumes not exceeding 260 square cubic meters. So um, we have a relatively small system in, in this presentation. So just to move on a little bit, um, as you step back a little bit from, from the finished product and say that um, particularly in uh, the, the protection of water mist um, turbine enclosures, there is a huge amount of documentation and I'll hark back a little to what Mark was saying. Um, every, every client asks for an enormous amount of documentations and, and a lot of that can differ. So um, to, hear the, to hear about the project that Mark has described earlier is music to, to our ears as a manufacturer. And we look very much forward to having some more standardization in the terms of the documentation that needs to be produced. But the minimum, of course, is a technical document. So um, a system that is produced will have its own DIOM and that will look something like we have on the right hand side of the screen um, and there will be uh, tests factory testing uh, live and you can see in the photograph this is an example of one of one of the the systems being tested before it's being delivered to to its final site so this is just um, an a quick slide showing, you know, FM approvals. It's important that when you when you are going to to supply a system, that it should be approved by a certifying body. In this case, FM, um, and also a quality system is generally required by by the by the client, um, ISO nine thousand and one or or something equivalent. Sometimes. A client will ask for some specific testing to be done. Uh, in this case, and it's quite uh, quite common in turbine enclosures, a customer will ask for a cooling test. And the objective of, of that is to see how fast uh, your so not not how fast you're going to extinguish the fire necessarily, but how smoothly you can cool that uh, temperature within the enclosure down so as not to damage the equipment inside. Uh, so the faster, the faster you cool the system down, the more likely it is that you're going to damage the, the turbine itself. So a cooling test is something that shows how your system and each system and each system's manufacturer has a different way of, of doing this and a different uh, different way of cooling. But here we have a picture of a mock-up that was built and, and, and a cooling test that came. The curve shows that in, in this particular test that we did, the, the cooling is actually very, very close to natural 
air cooling within within a similar enclosure. So that was seen as being a, a, a very positive aspect of a water mist system inside a turbine enclosure. Let's <clears throat> move on a little bit to the manufacturing process and just uh, to show you a few photographs. So um, the firefighting skid is generally, um, it's not a plug and play, but it's, it's based on the idea of a plug and play. So we have a standard uh, container, which is uh, built and within that uh, container, we fit all the uh, instrumentation, which is required to release the system. So it's, it can be literally uh, on completion lifted and dropped into place, whether on a platform or where, wherever it needs to be. I don't know if you can see the arrow um, moving on my screen, but um, we, we can see on the right hand side here, we've got five uh, square plates and I'll just say a little bit more about those on the next slide. These plates are actually weighing devices and these, these plates sit on, um, on the bottom of the container and they hold each water bottle. So each 67.5 litre bottle of water is located on top of a weighing device which is fixed in place inside the firefighting skid. Uh, they're intended to support the weight and the balance of the cylinders and also they send signal, signals to the control station advising if, a nominal, if the nominal water weight is lower than required. The weighing device will send signal, signals to the control panel as the weight changes with an alarm sounding once 10% of the total weight of the cylinder has been lost. Um, this, this system is used on water uh, cylinders only and, and it's a good way of controlling and being able to ensure that you always have the sufficient quantity of water required for your minimum discharge time. Each of the devices has a rubber isolation mat as to segregate, segregate the two different materials, so between the weighing, the weighing plate and the bottom of the cylinder. And the weighing devices are fixed to the floor of the firefighting skid. And this is the finished product, so not quite plug and play, but what you can see is we, you have uh, a nice tidy unit which can, can be lifted onto a container and then flown in a helicopter, usually helicopter dropped into place on, onto, onto the platform. Uh, sizes can vary, um, we tend to keep them to standard skid sizes, so um, if we're thinking about gas turbine um, enclosures, we would be lo looking at something like a 20 foot container or, or a 40 foot container. Um, and that's the end. Uh, I'll leave you with um, the, the final destination of one of our turbine water mist uh, turbine protection systems, um, Hasta Astin in this case. And thank you very much for, for your time this afternoon. <laughs>